Well, thanks everyone for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's um, so fun to see how much excitement this subject generates. Um, I'm Tim McConnell. I'm the Director of Engineering at 3D Robotics. Our office is here in Otay Mesa. We have other offices in Berkeley, Austin, Texas, and our manufacturing in Tijuana. Um, it's very exciting for me and a lot of fun to be doing this for a lot of reasons. One, because, well, it's flying robots, right? You know, I wake up every morning and think I'm going to go make robots fly. How, much, how great is that? Second, um, I've got three daughters who have all um, left the house now. And I've been in engineering for decades. And they've always known that I did something in engineering. But if you ever ask them what I actually did for a living, none of them could really answer until I took the job at 3D Robotics. And the day I took the job, my daughter, who's a mechanical engineering student at Olin College of Engineering in Boston, texted me and said, Dad, all my friends think you're cool. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's really the measure of success for me is you know, if my da daughters think I'm cool, then I'm doing OK. So this is a picture of our, um, our main flagship product, which is the Iris. Um, actually, we've just upgraded it to the Iris Plus, and you can get that on our website, 3DRobotics.com. So I'll talk a little bit about um, those aircraft that we make, the uh, consumer aircraft, a little about the history of the company, and then I'll talk about some of the um, commercial aircraft that we use for um, industrial uses as well as conservation use um, and a number of other applications. And I think it's a small enough room here that we don't have to be really formal about holding all your questions and things. So if you have some pressing question that can't wait till the end, go ahead and raise your hand and we can get to it. And um, we'll see if we can get, get through all my slides anyway. <clears throat> so the story of 3D robotics, um, it was started by a couple of just some of the most brilliant people I've ever known. First, Chris Anderson, who was the editor in chief of Wired magazine. Um, he was playing around on the weekend with his kids and wanted to get them excited about technology. So he um, got a Lego Mindstorms kit and he uh, built an airplane out of, out of that that was basically the first you know, drone built out of a Lego system. And that, that airplane that he built with his kids is now on display at the um, Lego Museum in uh, Denmark, I believe it is. Um, so that was you know, his start. He got so excited about that that he wanted to learn more. So he created a website um, which turned into a community called DIYDrones.org. And for those that don't know the expression DIY, it's do it yourself. And you'll hear people talking a lot these days about the, the DIY community. So he created a community, DIY Drones. Um, Jordi Munoz joined that community. He's a, a young man that grew up uh, just south of the border here. He's from Ensenada, grew up in Tijuana. Brilliant young guy, and he had moved here to the States. He was living in Riverside and waiting for his green card application to go through. And he was kind of bored because he couldn't work yet and he needed something to do. So he started, you know, tearing apart electronic things. He took a, a Wii controller and tore it open, pulled out some of the sensors and stuck it on, stuck it on one of his remote co copters and made the first autopilot uh, RC copter out of that. Took some videos, posted them on DIY drones, Chris Anderson saw the videos and said, I need to talk to this young man. The two of them got together, and they formed 3D Robotics. That was about five years ago. Um, Jordy was first making little electronic circuit boards and um, reflowing the solder in an oven that he made from a uh, toaster oven that he bought at Walmart. And he had hacked the uh, temperature control on that. And he was making these circuit boards and selling them to people from the DIY drones community. It grew really fast until the, the uh, picture, see, I don't know if I have a laser, you know, the picture here on the lower left is the, the factory that grew here in uh, Kearney Mesa and did very well. And they, they just grew hugely and started selling them on their website, grew so much that uh, they decided they needed to build a factory in, in Mexico. So they built up the current factory in Tijuana. And um, we've been growing at about 100% uh, annually for the last several years. So we're up to about 200 people. About half of those are in Mexico, uh, about 50 of them here in San Diego. Uh, Berkeley is the headquarters, and we've been growing some engineering expertise up there as well. And our marketing and video production team is in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> this is a, a history of the, the brains of our aircraft. So we make a couple of different things in, in a very large scale. One is, you know, remote controlled and autopiloted uh, aircraft, copters and uh, fixed wing aircraft. And then we actually make the, the brains itself, the autopilot. 
So the first autopilot was developed on an, uh, let's see, I can probably do this with my right hand, on an Arduino platform, which uh, those of you in engineering courses are probably pretty familiar with them. It's a great um, open tool for being able to do very quick development of electronic systems that don't require you to, you to be smart about soldering things together. So they made the first auto, Ardu pilot in 2009, and that's basically grown over the past several years to our, our current product, which is called the PixHawk. Um, and that's last year's version. There's actually a newer version of that coming out uh, in just a couple of months. <clears throat> um, and then the community of people that develop for this is called DIY Drones. There's uh, 54,000 users on there. Um, you can read all the, all the numbers associated with that. A lot of people involved in this. And this is one of the things that makes it so exciting to work at 3D Robotics is that the, the source code that we use for the autopilot is being developed by hundreds, thousands of people throughout the world. It's all open source development. We don't own the IP for any of the software, um, which means we don't make money off the software, but on the plus side, it means it gets developed really fast. So there's some, some brilliant people involved in that and um, really pushing the technology much faster than any of the closed uh, commercial companies can do it. And that's why 3D Robotics is really leapfrogging ahead of the competition as far as the capabilities of the systems that we have. And I'll show you some of those capabilities in some further slides. Um, we've just announced uh, a cloud application called DroneShare, where people from the community co can go and share their flight information with other people. So you can um, fly your aircraft wherever you are in the world, download the logs from that, upload them to DroneShare, and then other people can go and kind of share data and look what other people have done and see other people's flight information. Just a really fun and exciting way for everyone to share and feel connected with what they're doing. <clears throat> Um, and then something brand new today, you people are the, probably about the first people in America that are being spoke to verbally about this since it was just announced, um, I'm going to say, seven or eight hours ago in Germany. Um, it uh, was announced at the Embedded Linux, Linux Conference in Germany, and it's called DroneCode.org, and it's basically an open source collaborative endeavor to bring people in the community together and to take all the open source work out from under the auspices of 3D Robotics into a, um, an independent organization which is uh, governed by the Linux Foundation. So, you know, really well-known, solid organization keeping track of that and uh, taking care of the open source code. So DroneCode.org, you can go visit that and learn all about the open source aspect of the software. <clears throat> um, do want to talk a bit today about the, the San Diego Tijuana connection and uh, how important I think that is, not only to, to my industry, but to um, a lot of the industries that probably a lot of you will be entering into over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Um, we're really uniquely positioned here with, you know, great technological capabilities in the area, as well as, you know, low-cost manufacturing and low-cost engineering capabilities in Tijuana. Um, I have a Sentry card. Our office is down. This is actually a, a Google map um, track from my office down to our factory in, uh, in Mexico, and I go down there. I was down there the day before yesterday. I go down there about once every couple of weeks, and it's just a great way to be able to quickly iterate between engineering design and manufacturing capability, and there's uh, so few places in the world that have this sort of unique positioning to do this. San Diego has the most capable drone community anywhere in the U.S. If you think about the on the military side, which we're not really involved in, um, but a great source of engineering resource and expertise between Northrop Grumman, General Atomics, British Aerospace, the, you know, all the, the major drone manufacturers are based here in San Diego. Um, we're also building up a huge robotic community in San Diego. So there's just incredible engineering expertise. I don't know if any of you saw in the, in the Union Saturday, but uh, on Friday there was a big conference at UCSD on robotics, and they're starting up a new robotics institute to try to really make this the center of robotic development. Combine that with, with Tijuana, where you've got not only low-cost manufacturing, and you know, let's forget about China right now, because the, the salaries in China have come up as high to where it's not any cheaper. You're not paying pe people less money to manufacture in China as you are in Tijuana. They're right across the border, but also there's a great number of really sharp engineering talent in Tijuana as well. There's some wonderful engineering universities there as well, so you can get the, the manufacturing expertise that they've built up over several decades, um, brilliant young engineering talent, 
and then the close collaboration between what we're doing here in San Diego and what our counterparts are doing in Tijuana. So I, I think you'll be hearing a lot more of that over the next several years about companies growing up their, their combined expertise in cross-border collaboration. So I'm very excited about that, and it gives me a chance to practice my Spanish. Um, ah, as I mentioned, the, the, the wages, um, you know, there's really good reasons for being able to, to do this, what we call nearshoring, where we're um, working with, with uh, resources in Tijuana. You know, we can turn the prototypes around really fast. We can build a prototype in Tijuana, ship it up to San Diego, play around with it the next day. The engineers can look through it, decide what they want changed. And instead of, you know, calling up someone in India or Vietnam or China and saying, we'd like this change, and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see that turned around in a week or two, you know, we can have it done the next day. So it's, uh, it's really a great way to work together, and you really get that team camaraderie where you've got folks coming from, from Tijuana to our office and vice versa and working hand in hand. And, and the wages have come together. As, as you can see, they've really evened out. <clears throat> so these are some of the main um, uh, consumer products that we sell. On 3DRobotics.com is where we uh, do sell the aircraft. These are on the upper left there is the Iris. And then uh, this is an X8 because it's shaped like an X. And there are eight pairs of uh, motor and propeller combinations. This here is a Y6. You can figure out the math on that one and a fixed-wing aircraft. Um, most of what we sell are copters, but fixed-wing aircraft are really good for some applications as well. And I'll talk a little more about those. <clears throat> so just a little background about me. Um, started out doing my bachelor's th thesis on robotics at MIT in 1986. And I thought, wow, robotics is going to be my career. I'm going to go straight into it, and all these exciting things are going to happen. And this was, um, you know, 25 plus years ago when everyone said, we're really at the place now where ro robotics is going to be happening everywhere. Well, it turned out robotics was happening in Detroit. And uh, if you wanted to work in robotics, you were going to go work at a, at a big facility that made cars, because that's where all the industrial robots were. And it's taken a long time to get from that state to where we are now, where there really is you know, more robotic development being done. I moved out to San Diego to work for the Linkabit Corporation, which uh, those of you who have been around a while know that it's it was the foundation of all telecommunications companies here in San Diego, founded by a, um, a couple of, you know, kind of well-known people, uh, Andrew Viterbi and Erwin Jacobs, who later went on to start a small place called Qualcomm. <clears throat> uh, went to a company here called AP Labs, Dr. Design, those who've been around a while will know that those names. Uh, Vision Robotics, where I built um, large terrestrial robots for agriculture. This is a robot that... Uh, automatically prunes grapevines using stereo vision to determine where to make the cuts and how to prune the vines so you get the best production. Solokai Systems here in Sorrento Valley, and then um, finally 3D Robotics. <clears throat> um, just a quick example of uh, one of the great technologies that's been developed by our open source community um, and by our software engineers up in Berkeley is the follow me capability. And this is, ours is the only robot that can do this. You don't have to program this robot to do anything. Pull out your phone, you push the one button on the uh, application that says follow me, and there's Brandon running with a robot following him and videoing him wherever he goes. Um, no remote control flying capabilities, no complex software programming, just tell it follow me. There it's uh, following some of our engineers on the back of a boat following someone else biking. So great for kite surfing, skiing, skateboarding. Do you have a button to follow your daughter? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the beauty is, you know, it can easily be developed. We've got op open APIs, so that would be a, that would be a great application. <clears throat> um, so lots of different applications that you can do with these drones. And we've, we've thought of a few of them, and people are, you know, starting to implement a few of them. But there are, you know, over the next five years, you're going to see applications that these systems are used for that none of us in this room is thinking of right now. Or maybe one of you is thinking of one of them that I've never considered. And then in two years, you're going to say, I thought of that when I heard Tim McConnell talking about this stuff. Um, Nature Conservancy is a great one for it. They're using them to, um, to track rhino poachers in Africa. They're using them to track the um, deforestation in South America. Um, all sorts of different examples. In fact, I think I have another picture. Oh, I've got one coming up that we just got this weekend of something in Mexico. I'll show you. 
um, environmental response, um, first responders, search and rescue is just a huge broad avenue there for our police departments and fire departments. Um, there's a great competition that just happened a couple weeks ago in Australia. It's called the Outback Challenge where you have to get a drone to go out into a large area of the outback and find a lost hiker named Outback Joe. You have to locate him and then um, deliver water and a little bit of food to this lost hiker. And the winner, of the, whoever does the best job, gets $50,000. So there's you know, some serious investment in being able to use these things for real purposes. Um, construction, extreme for sports photography. Um, so consumer is what we're selling the most of right now. But enterprise is what's really going to push the limits of this technology. Um, agriculture is, um, let's say, the low-hanging fruit of uh, the enterprise area for what we can do with drones. Um, to be able to map a field and uh, determine things about the health of the plants and the crops and what types of things you want to do to the crop has huge value to the farmer. You know, if you think you know, a farmer that has a multi-thousand acre crop can go kind of walk around the edges and look at some trees or look at some vines and get some sense of how things are doing. But if you can give the farmer a drone that can fly over the field and give accurate data every single day in the visual spectrum or in, you know, non-visual spectrums that will tell you more about the health of the plants, then the farmer can be much more accurate and precise about how he or she controls the the crops, the watering, the fertilization, pesticides and things, and become you know, much cleaner about doing things like that and uh, get much better um, return on that. So the farmers are really excited about it. Another advantage there is that farmers own all their land, so you're not running into any sort of uh, privacy issues. It's a little easier space for people to be able to test out and use drones. Sorry, I saw it. Yes? That's a terrific question. Right now, they really like it to be sunny and not raining and things. But there are, you know, one of the things that uh, Enterprise is really going to push is the development of drones that can handle harsher conditions, you know, to be able to fly in inclement weather and to be able to handle more dust and dirt and things will be really important. Um, also, when you get Enterprise drones flying around in dirty situations like imagine um, after the Fukushima disaster, you know, having drones that could go in with radiation detectors and things, there's going to be a lot of dust and crud flying around or in large power plants and things. So that'll be great room for innovation for the, the technology and the hardware. <clears throat> um, in uh, um, construction, so agriculture is the biggest industry in the world and construct construction is the second largest. So construction is another great area for drone development. Um, those who have been to San Jose may have visited this fry store. A lot of the fry stores have different themes. This is sort of the Aztec theme. We did a, a one-button mapping. Um, again, no RC requirement. You simply take out the phone and push, um, draw a circle around what you want to map and push the map. And the drone flew around. And um, from the pictures we took, we created this 3D model um, that we could stitch together. Um, and it's great for uh, construction. If you imagine you've uh, designed your plans for a construction site and you want to match those plans up to what's actually happening on the ground, you could have a drone going out and doing a map of your construction site every day and you could overlay your plans on top of that and uh, get a sense of how it's being developed and what kind of progress you're making and what types of changes you want to make. <clears throat> Another different view of the 3D model we built. So um, you could do that with your house. You could take, take your drone out and do a, a map of your house, create a 3D model, and show it to your friends. Um, it's great for uh, people who are actually using this for watching the movement of plates in earthquakes. So if you went out to where there are two, two plates near each other and you did a map of that every day, you can actually you know, compare the, the images from one day over the course of a month or two months and see how much the, the plates are shifting. <clears throat> Um, bridge decay. So the Department of Transportation has um, estimated that there are 63,000 bridges in the United States that are considered structurally deficient. Of those, I think about 20,000 are considered fracture critical, which is a little scary when you think that there are you know, millions of vehicles traveling across these bridges every day. And there's so many of them, you have to know which ones to fix first. So how do you inspect the bridges? Well, right now they have these you know, giant machines. If you picture that thing, it's blocking off a lane of traffic. 
there's probably one person stopping traffic, two people con controlling the machine, and it probably takes hours and hours to try to get that thing underneath and get a reasonable um, view of the bridge. You can send someone out to do it, um, you know, hanging on by a tether. That doesn't seem very safe. You can send this guy in with his jetpacks. <laughs> but there's, you know, got to be something better. What can we do? Is it important to inspect the bridges? Well, of course it is. You know, we want to be able to, most of these bridge collapses were all bridges that, you know, needed to be repaired. And in the post analysis of the accidents, they said, wow, you know, we could have gone in and fixed that and prevented these disasters. <clears throat> It's not just bridges, there's infrastructure all over the place. In our country, there are 2 million miles of pipelines, 140,000 miles of railroad tracks, uh, 2.7 million miles of uh, power lines. Um, SDG&E has 26,000 miles of power lines, and uh, those go through 450,000 trees. Maybe, excuse me, maybe you're going to get to this, but what's the uh, life source for these the size that you've pictured up there, I mean, um, you talk about one that you could operate by battery for That's a great question. All day so so the, the copters that we sell on the website, the Iris, flies for about 15 minutes with a camera attached to it. Um, the fixed wing aircraft we sell will fly for closer to an hour. Um, and then larger aircraft can, can fly for longer distances. So, for example, for you know, scanning power lines and things. You could take a, a number of small fixed wing aircraft and be able to fly 70 or 80 miles in one flight. So you can extrapolate about how many you need of those. Um, but if you think about how much money they spend right now on inspecting these things, um, I talked to some folks from SDG&E just a few weeks ago. They were visiting us and looking at our drones. They currently inspect these um, high tension power lines in the poles with four helicopters. Those four helicopters are flying all day, every day, and they cost an average for each helicopter is about $1,500 an hour to fly. So, you know, you guys are all closer to math classes than I can remember, but if you, if you extrapolate that, there's a whole bunch of money they're spending doing these things. Compare that to being able to have a drone fly autonomously, and there's great financial incentive to be able to do these things with drones. Can I have a question about the clarity? Mm -hmm. Can, is it, are they working on improving the clarity, the more pixels or whatever, whatever the technology is? Because some of them don't seem as sharp. Absolutely. I mean, right now there's, you know, cameras take, that can take HDMI imagery. So, you know, a GoPro camera gives you pretty good, you know, the latest GoPro cameras give you pretty good uh, detail and resolution. Um, depends on how high you fly, what type of clarity you want, and what type of detail you want on it. Or what kind of money you're willing to spend. Exactly. Sure. Mm -hmm. I just had a question about um, flight plans and the FAA and, um, you know, intersecting paths and, and piloted vehicles. Excellent question. Let's, let's remind me and we'll get back to that a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so inspection of these things is all very important. So right now they're using helicopters to, to inspect all these things. And um, those of you that are old enough to remember... Uh, Clint Eastwood movies. There's a scene that starts like that in a Clint Eastwood movie and ends badly. Um, <clears throat> you can also send these guys out in their orange suits to inspect, but it might take a little too long. Um, another number that I heard from a friend whose brother is in charge of pipeline inspection for Shell Oil in Canada said that his budget for one helicopter is $36,000 a day to inspect uh, oil pipelines. So big numbers we're talking about. But of course, if you don't inspect them, really bad things can be happening. <clears throat> so how do we inspect more efficiently? Well, you all know the answer, right? Let's get some drones out there that can be inspecting the bridges and, uh, and the power lines and things. You know, put a camera on there, uh, give it a flight plan, uh, and have it go take pictures of all these things. That's what we can do right now. Take pictures and go inspect them afterward. By this time next year, we'll be able to take pictures and make intelligent decisions based on what we see. Right now, all of our aircraft um, gather data, and then we do post-processing on it. But we're just developing the technology to be able to put much higher powered processors onto these systems and be able to do processing on the fly so you can make intelligent decisions about what things you want to visualize and look at. <clears throat> so 3D robotics builds these unmanned systems that can be used for all of these things. So a few more pictures of our uh, facility and our, uh, and our products. Uh, this is one that uh, I just got this in the email yesterday. 
This is Corey Jaskolski, who used to be director of technology for National Geographic, and he just uh, sent this to, to one of our guys last week. Um, that's an Iris Plus that he just got, and he's down in a uh, cenote in Merida, Mexico, doing some, some analysis down there. So it's fun to see people out there making new uses of these things. Um, here's just a picture of some of the companies involved here in San Diego in the robotics community. Um, of course, I mentioned the three big drone makers. Uh, 5D Robotics is a company up in um, Carlsbad who's doing a lot of work with localization and very intelligent systems. Just saw a video they sent me this morning of a cool new demo that they're going to be unveiling at Legoland uh, with some drones that are autonomously piloted and driving around the park there. Um, <clears throat> I included Qualcomm here because they make the, their Snapdragon processor is really a a great utility for, for drones and for intelligent flying vehicles. So much of what we do in the drone industry has been driven by the cell phone industry. If you think about the, the things that live on a drone, you've got a tiny little camera that you want to weigh as little as possible. You've got um, uh, devices for measuring where you are and how you're turning and what your position is. You know, All those things have been developed by the cell phone industry. There's, there's gyroscopes in your phone, there's compasses in your phone, there's uh, you know, all sorts of things that know when you've rotated your screen or when you're, you know, moving fast and things. Um, and the Snapdragon is Qualcomm's latest processor, which is designed for phones, but they're really putting a lot of emphasis into robotics as well because it uh, has great capabilities. I mean, it's, it's a supercomputer on a chip that big that you can put on a robot, and then you can start making decisions on the robot. You know, tell it to do something like go find the front edge of the fire and follow, the, follow it along and map it out and give the information back. Or, you know, follow that vehicle or, you know, follow this soldier and, you know, make sure that, um, you know, he's not being approached by anyone. I mean, all sorts of intelligent things you can start doing. Um, Aerial Mob is another company up in uh, Carlsbad that's doing a lot of, um, they actually do commercial use of drones, but it's overseas that they do it. And we'll get back to the FAA discussion because right now, Almost nobody's doing commercial use of drones in the U.S. because it's restricted, except with special exceptions. Um, <clears throat> Brain Corporation is a spin-off that's being um, incubated by Qualcomm right now. You may have seen some news about them. They're doing some really smart software to be running in robots to make robots think more like hu humans, to be able to have the robots learn so that you don't have to program everything, but it can, they can learn behaviors. Um, brilliant folks there that are doing some really neat work with the Qualcomm technology. <clears throat> Envision Robotics, my old company, is doing great things for agriculture. <clears throat> okay, one more video just to show some of the fun stuff that you can do. I'd like to say that's me on the rock, but... Uh, <laughs> Where else are you going to get a shot like that? You know, where you're, you're 10 feet out from where this guy is, just getting these amazing shots. And, you know, think of all the places you'd be where you think, if I could put a camera 20 feet away from where I am right now, it'd be incredible. So, so not just great commercial uses, but a lot of really fun, cool stuff you can do. And that's it for my slides. So we'll get back to your question, and then we can um, have time for some more questions. So you had asked about, and this is, this, we could probably spend the rest of the time talking about regulations and things, but I'll give a quick overview of where we are with regulations and, um, and where, uh, where I think we're heading and where you all may uh, you know, have some thoughts about that as well. So right now there's um, a restriction by the FAA on commercial use of drones. So you really are not allowed to use drones for any commercial use in the United States, except if you have a special exception. Um, and it's, it's called a 333 exemption. There's a long form that you have to fill out to be able to apply for that. SDG&E has applied and received one to be able to test inspection of their power lines. There's a consortium of movie makers that have applied for one to be able to do some filmmaking. And there's some other companies that have done them. But for the for the large part, um, there's no commercial use of drones in the U.S. right now. Other countries are much more 
uh, progressive about allowing drones for commercial use. Australia is really um, a great development area where lots of things are happening there. In fact, Google is doing all their testing of drone delivery systems in Australia because the, the laws there are um, so much more open to that type of development. Um, Japan is really open to drone usage in a number of places in Europe as well as Canada. Um, so right now you really can't do anything commercially with drones in the U.S. And for those consumer drones, you need to stay below 400 feet. You're not supposed to fly within five miles of an airport. Um, and then there's need to be laws developed for how do we keep people safe? And um, people obviously have lots of concerns about privacy as well. So it's a great, great sort of intersection of engineering and um, concern for society and those with uh, legal minds. There'll be a lot of conversation going on on this over the next few years. My opinion is that over the next um, several years, people will become somewhat more accepting as they get more used to the concept. You'll notice I use the word drone all the time. Um, some people in the industry shy away from that. They like to say UAV or remotely piloted vehicle or autonomous system. I like to say drone because I think there shouldn't be anything scary or military about the word drone, right? The military has done more with drones than anyone else up till now, and they've, they've pushed some of the technology forward, which is great. But there's nothing about these things that requires them to be military or weaponized systems. And I, I really want to push people's understanding of what these things can do and of all the, the good uses of this technology. So I want people to just get used to thinking and hearing about them. Um, privacy is obviously a big issue in a lot of people's minds. And like any technology, you know, it can be used for good and it can be used for nefarious purposes. Um, if I wanted to take some private video of someone that they didn't, you know, didn't know I was taking, I wouldn't use the drone to do it. You can hear these things coming from, you know, 100 yards away. Um, but, you know, I understand people's, people's concern about that. And um, one, people get a little more used to them, but two, people just need to be reasonable about what can and can't be done. I don't personally think there need to be a lot more laws generated on privacy because everything you hear about with people using drones to take pictures of people that they shouldn't, they're already breaking the law. There are plenty of laws protecting people's privacy. You're not allowed to take pictures of people in their, um, <clears throat> you know, in their own private spaces or in their homes and things. But that's, again, something that will be a conversation that will be carried on a lot more in legal circles than, than in my world. Safety is the other piece. The FAA is more concerned about safety than anything. And your question about traffic and how do things interact with each other is something that's you know, really going to have a lot of involvement, a lot of people pushing that technology. NASA is actually uh, pushing a, an effort right now to, to develop um, kind of a system like the air traffic control system where, where drones can kind of apply for space and where they all communicate with each other and they, they know where each other are. Um, so that's on the, on the legal side and on the regulatory side and on the technical side, there needs to be a lot more work done and there's work done in the universities right now on sense and avoid. This is right now the drones can follow a path very well, but if you stick something in its way, it's not going to know and it's going to run right into it. And really, to, if we get to the point to have lots of drones flying around, they need to be able to see each other, avoid each other, and uh, hopefully not cause, cause crazy accidents. Yeah, you mentioned uh, privacy. Uh, I'm the uh, president of our homeowners association, and we've already got two complaints uh, about uh, drones being in the community in a close proximity. Uh, are they looking in my yard? Are they looking at my 13-year-old daughter in the pool? Um, mm -hmm. but I, so you're saying right now there's no regulation other than the 400 feet uh, flying height and there's no FAA regulations other than that. So according to the FAA, you can fly, you know, if you're not flying in someone's private property, you can fly up to 400 feet. But I think there are other laws. I think, you know, if somebody took a picture of your daughter in the pool, I'm pretty sure they're violating other privacy laws. Just like if somebody came, you know, stood next to your property and held a cell phone over your fence and took a picture. And I'm, I'm not an expert on that type of thing, but I, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of uh, regulations there. Whether it's enough or not, whether it's going to get pushed, pushed further, you you get me a little out of my realm of expertise, but I think it's it's exciting to have the conversation anyway, and it'll be um, it'll be on people's minds a lot as and we move forward. What's the cost right now for um, individuals <coughs> to purchase something of that? 
the, the, the Iris Plus is $750. That's without a gimbal or a GoPro. So then you buy a GoPro camera for a couple hundred dollars, and the gimbal is a couple hundred beyond that. So a whole system like that is, I think, between eleven and twelve hundred dollars. Yes. Tim, what's next for 3D robotics? Are you guys going to be doing more software development uh, capabilities or hardware? Super question. Super. So we're we're involved in both. Um, right now we're selling this hardware, um, some exciting things that will be coming down the pike that I can't really talk about, uh, but a, a lot more, we're getting a lot more focus on software as well. As I mentioned, the, the Drone Code Foundation was just announced today, and that's really geared toward making um, a lot faster advances in the software realm. The idea is that ultimately, I mean, we, we've kind of mastered the autopilot capability and the, the ability to fly a quadcopter around. There will be advances made there. But probably the, the great leaps in technology in this space are going to be in the software realm. What, what can you do with the images? How can you fly these things? So we're building up a, an entire software platform with um, available SDK and APIs so that people can add on their own capabilities to that and really try to push the limits of you know, what type of um, you know, sensors can you talk to down you know, below, the, below the stack and on top of the stack, you know, what types of things can you do up in the cloud? How can you process the data, how can you get people more information from what they're learning about that. So. And then part of it, we just don't know. You know, there's so many exciting things happening that we're just trying to keep ourselves a little ahead of the curve and then every year we'll look around and say, what else should we be doing here? Commercial is going to be another big space for us now. We've largely focused on the consumer space, but I think the, the real big growth is going to be in the consumer, in the commercial arena, so we'll be doing a lot more work there as well. Yes. You mentioned you manufacture in Mexico, but do you also sell in Mexico? We do. You do. Yes. Are you limited to any industry? I'm sorry? Are you limited to which industry in Mexico? Uh, well, most of our sales right now are to consumers, so it's not really, we, we don't have any current relationships with any Mexican um, industry, um, but probably will fairly soon. Uh, but we sell worldwide. There are only a few countries that we can't ship things to. That's another, you know, regulatory space that's a little tricky because, you know, as far as um, uh, the Department of Commerce is concerned, this is really sort of a, a new area. You know, are these toys? Well, they're, they're pretty dangerous for toys. They're real, are they helicopters? Well, they can't carry people around. I mean, it's a, it's a new type of system that hasn't been well defined. And so how they regulate commerce and how these things get shipped is another thing that um, will keep a number of lawyers busy for a few years to come. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection between autopilot and remote control? Sure. Drones? Sure. So um, up until just you know a few years ago, all all vehicles that you saw down at the RC fields were remote control. So you've got a you know device in your hand with a couple of sticks and you're flying it around. Um, the idea of the autopilot is to be able to have a brain on board that, into which you can load commands and then you just tell it go and then you don't have to have any inputs to it. And it knows, using its GPS sensor, magnetometer, gyroscope, barometer, it can figure out exactly where it is. And it can tape, take a full set of commands that you've given it. So you can take a map and point to a bunch of places and say, I want you to go to all these spots and then come back and land where you started. And then you just say go, and it doesn't require any control of that, and it will fly itself. So that's, that's what the autopilot that's gives you. That's what Jeff Bezos wants to do like for Amazon deliver your packages. So I I have my thoughts about Jeff Bezos when, and the, and the one is, you know, he came out on 60 minutes, I believe it was the first week of December last year and said we're going to be delivering packages to homes. Well, the more you think about it, the harder that is. And he was said he said some crazy time like the end of this year, or the end of next year or something. I'm sure he knew as well as all of us in the industry that it was nowhere near that time frame, but my real thought was he's got everyone in the country talking about Amazon in the first part of December. The guy's a genius, right? <laughs> but yeah, that is the idea, that he wants to be able to, you know, somehow fly a drone from one place to another and deliver a package from one spot to another. Mm -hmm. Delivering packages to people's yards, I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. You know, those of us with kids and dogs probably don't really want something with little blades spinning at 5,000 RPM landing down in the middle of the yard. But there are, you know, there are lots of things that they will be able to do with delivery. Besides the U.S., what other country is really advancing technology? Um, 
really uh, a lot of our developers and a lot of the people that I interact with on a regular basis are in Australia. Australia is uh, pushing it a lot. Um, there's a lot of work being done in conservation systems in Africa. Um, Africa is a great example of a place where you've got you know, huge expanses of, of land. You've got lots of endangered species. You've got lots of people that don't have access to the type of infrastructure and technology that we have here. So you know, that's a great area for, for development, not only on the conservation side, but on being able to reach people and being able to do things for people. Like you know, delivery of medicine, for example, is a, is a great space there in Africa. Um, Japan and Canada are another couple of places that come to mind where they're doing a lot of development. I see that there's a little bit of lot of bad guys trying to use this for them. How are we going to stop the bad guys? Yeah, that's 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 a great question. I saw I read an article in a Mexican newspaper um, a couple of months ago about uh, narco drones, where apparently there are the, some of the cartels down there are already buying drones to be able to, you know, deliver illicit packages. You know, and think about it, it's you could fly one right across the border, and how are they going to stop that? So, I think there will be technology being developed in that realm as well to figure out how to track these things and how to know that people aren't doing bad things with them. Um, I just, you know, am thankful to know that, to, that we haven't heard of any terror uses of them yet, but certainly, you know, there are, there are terrible people thinking of terrible things they can do with those as well. So it's a great question, and it's really something we have to be thinking about as well. Yes? I mean, you've talked about uh, <coughs> earshoring and uh, the price of labor Mexico and a uh, short supply chain. Is there something more to the equation than those dollar and cents kind of things in terms of a relationship uh, between San Diego and Tijuana and the United States and Mexico and California and Dodge? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've, I've learned a lot of that in the last year since I've been at 3D Robotics. I've, um, you know, I've, I've developed a really strong relationship with a lot of the uh, people that, that work in Tijuana and have found that it's a uh, it's a really nice, cordial interchange, and you know, much as I'd like to think we can communicate well with anyone in the world, it's nice to be able to interact with people that are, you know, of a fairly similar mindset. There is the language challenge. Most of the folks down there speak uh, English pretty well, and I do okay with Spanish. Um, but you know, the, the Mexican civilization and the U.S. civilization are pretty close in sort of the way they interact and the way we communicate, which really helps makes it easy. Um, very easy folks to work with, and a lot of people on both sides of the border who are really focusing now on trying to develop those, those strong partnerships across the border. I was just down, I was giving a tour of some of the um, roboticists from the conference on Friday. We went down Saturday to Mexico, and we had um, a fellow from the Tijuana Economic Development Council who was talking with me about all the efforts that they're making there to be able to sort of promote these interactions between San Diego companies and Tijuana companies. And um, it's really, it's a nice, easy thing to develop. And I've, I've discovered that I have kind of a passion for it myself, and I'm really interested in promoting that as well. Thank you very much. Oh, it's really been my pleasure. Thank you all.